There are many, many different approaches to the subject of ethics foundations. I have listed the most important here. Of course, uh, well, uh, don't be afraid because they mo all more or less lead to the same set of basic values. And I am going to use the last, being a scientific myself, I am going to use the last one. The last one which is very close to the um, objectivist approach. The, the main difference being that even more care is given to precise statement of the premises and a step-by-step -step derivation of the conclusions. So the basic premise of our approach is about the maintenance of life. All functions of all living organisms have but one objective, to maintain the life of the organism. <clears throat> so no, no, war, no wonder that uh, an organism's life is its standard of value. That which furthers its life is the good and that which threatens the life is the evil. Uh, applied to man, which is a particular very evolved organism, these statements are the very foundation of ethics. Said Ayn Rand uh, 30 years ago, I let you read it. Note that 150 years ago, the great French libertarian Frédéric Bastia was already saying almost the same thing. Well, it is interesting to note that Ayn Rand was a pure atheist, while from the very first sentence here, Frédéric Bastia is making a reference to God. So it is fortunate that those two different approaches, the religious or the para-religious one and the atheist one, are leading to the same conclusions. So any living organism must react to external signals, get food, and propagate through various actions. In plants and in inferior organisms, those actions are purely automatic, like the temperature control in your apartment. Let, let me buzzer you a few minutes with um, a uh, feedback control loop because it's going to serve our purpose later on. So this is, uh, this is a drawing, a symbolic drawing of a control loop. For example, the temperature control in, in your apartment. Uh, wh what is a controller? You, have, uh, you, are, you are setting a variable. For example, you want to set the temperature of your room at a certain point, okay, and you have a, a, an instrument, a thermometer, that reads the, temper the actual temperature in your room. And this device here, this black box, a controller, compares the controlled variable, which is the temperature of the room, 
and the, set, the point, the temperature that you have set on a dial. And if there is a difference between the two, a signal is, is sent and amplified and actions and actuator here, most likely in this case, uh, perhaps uh, a motor who is going to open more uh, the door or to, to open a valve to admit more fuel into your furnace. And this action is going to increase the temperature, to increase the control variable, up to a point where this variable here and the set point will be equal. So that's a feedback control mechanism. Now, in uh, animals, those actions are instinctive. They are governed by a control process that, that is similar to that one, but that I am calling algedonic after the British cybernetician Stafford Beer. Why algedonic? Algedon, algen is derived from the Greek pleasure, algen and, sorry, pain, pain and hedon. It is uh, the, the Greek for pleasure. So we have a loop here that would apply to animals. We have replaced the notion of set point by the notion of threshold, and there is a mechanism here called the brain or the spinal cord that compares uh, incoming signals of pain or pleasure to, uh, to the threshold. And uh, as some action is taken if, uh, for example, the pain exceeds uh, the threshold. For example, if you put your, your hand on a hot uh, plate, uh, if uh, there is too much of it, if, if you feel that pain and if uh, it is greater than the threshold, there is a signal that's going to be sent to the muscle and you are going to withdraw the hand. Now, that kind of a feedback control does exist in men, but it is far more complex, as you imagine, in particular because actions and their consequences can be memorized allowing learning and allowing improvement over time. Let us lean on that, on that slide for a minute. It shows <laughs> that uh, man has a brain, it's not always obvious, allowing him to analyze uh, all his perceptions and feelings, to initiate actions, to remember the outcome of the actions. Here, memory. And to analyze these outcomes and to draw conclusions on how to improve on them. This is the attribute of men called reason. Now, man being conscious of what he is doing, the notion of pain as a signal in the previous slide that we saw extends here to the notion of suffering, psychic as well as physical suffering, and similarly, the notion of pleasure extends to that of satisfaction, happiness, fulfillment. To avoid suffering and to look for fulfillment, a man must make efforts to produce goods that he will consume, exchange, or save. And the more he will make efforts, the more he will use his reason, the better the results. Now, let us, uh, let us uh, examine what are the conditions for that kind of elaborate feedback control to work properly. But for it to work properly, the human being, first of all, must be free to try. <clears throat> if he's not free to try, he's not going to learn. So we have the first attribute here, freedom. Now, he must uh, assume the consequences of his acts clearly the learning process is going to work only if man is left assuming the consequences of his acts. And that is called, that is called responsibility. Responsibility is 
the, the art of assuming the consequences of one's act. Um, he, he should be able to compare his results with those of other people and accept them to be different and draw rational conclusion from it, which means that he should avoid envy. If someone is more successful than you, the thing to do is not to hope that next time the other guy is going to be less successful, is to draw a lesson to, to be uh, more successful uh, oneself. He, he, should, uh, he should get the results of his efforts, clearly, for this loop to work, and not be stolen from the fruit of his efforts by other people. And he should be free to use them as he pleases. And in particular, he should be free to exchange them without constraints. And so, the, the, this idea here, this attribute, is of course the attribute of property. Now, he should be free to exchange his property with others, and for these exchanges to be efficient, they should exclude the lies. So, for all practical purposes, here are the moral values that one can uh, deduce from uh, this primary concept of life maintenance. And note that no particular individual was singularized in my derivation. If these principles apply to me, they must also apply to you. Which means that I must not achieve my own fulfillment at the expense of yours. One can use others only with their consent, usually through an exchange. And nothing should be obtained without their consent. Nothing should be obtained from another individual through coercion. Now, I hope that you have found this approach appealing, yet I told you that all approaches to ethics were leading to essentially the same basic rules of conduct, almost as if these rules were in fact contained in our very genes. And all approaches were nothing more than a posteriori justifications. And to make the point, I shall, compare, I shall compare the rules derived from my approach, this approach, to those derived from the first approach, which was on my list a moment ago, the Divine One. The Divine One, of course, is summarized in the Ten Commandments. And what do the Ten Commandments say? Well, we will, we will leave aside the uh, four first ones because they relate to the relationships between uh, man and God. And this is not the purpose of our topic, of course. The purpose of our topic is relationship with man with other men. And there we have the six following uh, commandments. And clearly, the three first, I'm not going to elaborate on them, but clearly, the three first are related to the maintenance of life. Directly here, or through, through the raising of the children. And then you have, of course, the, uh, the issue of property, the issue of authenticity, uh, the one of, um, and, and of course, the um, issue of envy. No, no. <laughs> okay. okay, show me your Bible. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Let me go back a minute uh, into that one here. Well, n now that uh, we are armed with uh, universally accepted moral values, we are in a position to evaluate the different politico-economic systems from the standpoint of their relationship to those values. Uh, on this slide here, I would like to emphasize two of the rules of conduct 
because they are also identified as rights, human rights, freedom and property. And to characterize the different econ political economic system, I am going, these two cri I am going to use uh, the, these two criteria here of uh, respect of rights, basically of freedom, and um, sorry, and uh, private property. So here is, here is a classification of the political economic systems along two axes here. On that ax, uh, any point on this axis represent a degree of private property. So here, all the, all the property is private and here everything is owned by the states. Similarly, on that scale here, you have the amount of rights detained by the individuals in, in uh, here, the individual have all the rights and governments have no purpose than protecting the individual rights, while here, of course, the state has all the rights and any rights that you can have are granted by the state. So if you use uh, that, that uh, scale here, you find that you can divide the political economic system into four, ta four types, yes. Uh, here, you have liberal capitalism. Um, it's, it's important to distinguish capitalism and liberal capitalism because fascism accepts private property, but in fascism the state has all the rights and you have about to know. So capitalism, in my talk, obviously whenever I use the concept of capitalism, I am referring to liberal capitalism and I urge you not to forget that for the rest of the talk. But there exists a non-liberal capitalism again. And in this quadrant here, we have a democratic socialism, and in this one, communism. Now, where do we stand in Western Europe? We, st we, we stand somewhere around here, which is not very good. The United States is faring a little better than the United States today. I would put it here. And the only country which is really advanced from the standpoint of uh, true liberalism is Switzerland. God protects her from going down that scale. <laughs> well, from, uh, from this slide, I don't think that you can find, on this slide, I, I don't think you, you, can, you cannot plot any country in the world that would be truly liberal, that would be here. Uh, we, we almost got that once in the history of humanity. We, um, it al almost existed in the United States for a century when state and federal governments did not yet dare to violate the Declaration of Independence. Which I remind for you here, at least the essential paragraph. This is very important, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. We are very far from that today, <laughs> unfortunately. Now, liberal capitalism is uh, nothing more than a practical application of the virtues that I have just described. In such a system, fulfillment is possible for whoever makes efforts, uses his reason, exchanges freely, and associates himself freely with others, in particular to designate a government whose sole purpose is to enforce the protection of individual rights. In all other systems, a central power dominates and spoliates to some extent the individual. 
This is why Ayn Rand could say that truly liberal capitalism was the only moral system that had ever existed. And in the next part of our talk, we are going to illustrate the main characteristic of liberal capitalism. For the sake of simplicity, I shall use, as I say, the word capitalism as a short for liberal capitalism. Now, what are the moral attributes of liberal capitalism? I'll uh, say a few words about each of them in turn. The first one is voluntary exchange, exchange without coercion. In the capitalist system, transfer of goods or services from an individual to another is not forced by law, expropriation, theft, loot, or ruler's favor, but achieved through voluntary exchange. Contrary to ancient kings or warlords, contrary to modern dictators and even to our government representatives, an enterprise, an enterprise obtained nothing by force. It serves people. It is bound to satisfy it, its customers and it loses all power, even General Motor uses all power if it is not able to ensure a better service than its competitors. And the biggest, biggest corporation in the world loses all power and influence as soon as it loses its customer. Now the next uh, attribute is a just reward of effort and reason. The one we, who produces and exchanges earns what he has. He doesn't give nor take what is not earned. He does not expect, expect to be paid for his good face, his tears, or a passive expression of his needs, but for what he has accomplished. This has been perhaps best expressed by Hank Riordan during his trial in Atlas Shrugged, the novel by Ayn Rand. I work for nothing but my own profit, which I make by selling a product they need to men who are willing and able to buy it. I do not produce it for their benefit at the expense of mine, and they do not buy it for my benefit at the expense of theirs. I do not sacrifice my interest to them, nor do they sacrifice theirs to me. We deal as equals by mutual consent to mutual advantage, and I, am, and I am proud of every penny that I have earned in this manner. I am rich, and I am proud of every penny I own. I made my money by my own effort, in free exchange, and through the voluntary consent of every man I dealt with. The voluntary consent of those who employed me when I started, the voluntary consent of those who work for me now, the voluntary consent of those who buy my product. I shall answer all the questions you are afraid to ask me openly. Do I wish to pay my workers more than their services are worth to me? I do not. Do I wish to sell my product for less than my customers are willing to pay me? I do not. Do I wish to sell it at a loss or give it away? I do not. If this is evil, do whatever you please about me according to whatever standards you hold. These are mine. I am earning my own living as every honest man must. I refuse to accept as guilt the fact of my own existence and the fact that I must work in order to support it. I refuse to accept as guilt the fact that I am able to do it and do it well. I refuse to accept as guilt the fact that I am able to do it better than most people the fact that my, my work is of greater value than the work of my neighbors and that more men are willing to pay me. I refuse to apologize for my ability. I refuse to apologize for my success. I refuse to apologize for my money. Next is equality of rights and uh, pros uh, prosperity. Well, most people would more or less agree with the idea that capitalism rewards the ones that are most diligent and do the best with their reason. They might even accept that this is just. Yet, what they find unjust is the resulting inequalities because they feel uh, 
people, people are not uh, equally gifted at birth and uh, should therefore uh, help out the, uh, the ones that are less gifted. What can be answered to that? This is a, this is a difficult point, really. Well, first, contrary to all other systems, capitalism does not accept the only unjust inequality, inequality before the, in front of the law. It has completely eliminated slavery, caste, nobility, privileges. Conversely, would it not be unfair to reward equally the lazy one and the one who is trying hard? the one who acts thoughtlessly, and the one who thinks. Besides, it is precisely that reward to effort and reason that makes this uh, algedonic control that I spoke about a moment ago uh, so efficient. And in, in a market economy, the wealth of the rich does not cause the po is not the cause sorry, of the poverty of the poor. The wealth of the rich makes the poor richer, not poorer. The rich provides capital and tools necessary to increase the production of the poor and the value of its work. And such is the story of technical progress and the extraordinary prosperity brought along by capitalism at all levels. All arguments in favor of redistribution of revenues assume implicitly that such a redistribution would not affect the average wealth. This assumption is contrary to every bit of existing experience. Forced equalization, and equalization can be obtained only by force, would immediately generate a dramatic fall of production as the Soviets have bitterly experienced. And finally, capitalism induces solidarity. It maximizes the incentives for people to look for mutually profitable exchanges and voluntary associations with other people. In the long run, because it develops the feeling of mutual dependence, it fosters the only solidarity that has any moral value, the voluntary one. A self-fulfillment. In the capitalist system, everyone is free to choose the work he prefers, to specialize in it, and to go as far to its success as his will and talents allow. Such success is determined by the objective value of, the, of one's work for others. When men are free to exchange, when no one can force production or consumption on anyone else, the best products are available in all areas of human action. Uh, reason triumph and uh, progress escalation. Uh, the physical worker consumes roughly the equivalent of the value he produces. The one who produces a useful idea and invention receives only an infinitesimal part of the value added to human wealth of which an unlimited number of people will benefit. Now, why is that a tribute to capitalism? Because in this system, creation is free, and there is always someone available to put in an ID to work using his own money or credit if necessary. In a controlled economy, on the other hand, creation disturbs, and the means necessary to materialize individual IDs are usually not available. Truth. <clears throat> well, truth uh, is, a, is a requisite for business efficiency. A company could not work, simply could not work, if the flow of information, technical, financial, etc., within, within the company was not reliable. And vis-a-vis -vis the customers, lying is simply too dangerous. It can, it can be used only once. As an illustration of what I am saying, uh, let me read you Exxon Corporation Ethics Policy. When I worked for Exxon, this document was, and uh, still is uh, for what I know, distributed to all employees around the world 
and their cover letter signed by the chief executive of the company. I am reading uh, only the most significant paragraphs. The policy of this corporation is one of strict observance of all laws applicable to its business. Our policy does not stop there. Even where the law is permissive, Exxon chooses a course of the highest integrity. Local customs, traditions and morals differ from place to place, and this must be recognized. But honesty is not subject to criticism in any culture. Shades of dishonesty simply invite demoralizing and reprehensible judgments. A well-founded reputation for scrupulous dealing is itself a priceless company asset. An overly ambitious employee might have the mistaken idea that we do not care how results are obtained as, as long as he gets results. We do care how we get results. We expect compliance with our standard of integrity throughout the organization. We will not tolerate an employee who achieves results at the cost of violation of laws or unscrupulous dealing. By the same token, we will support and we expect you to support an employee who passes up an opportunity or advantage which can only be secured at the sacrifice of principle. Equally important, we expect candor from managers at all levels and compliance with accounting rules and controls. We don't want liars for managers, whether they are lying in a mistaken effort to protect us or to make themselves look good. One of the kinds of harm which results when a manager conceals information from higher management is that subordinates within his organization think they are given the signal that company policies and rules can be ignored whenever inconvenient. This can result in corruption and demoralization of an organization. Our system of management will not work without honesty, including honest bookkeeping, honest budget proposals, and honest economic evaluation of projects. This is the last one piece. Well, free men have little incentive to destroy and much to lose in an armed conflict. Factories do not produce under bombs and markets cannot be held on battlefields. Y yet, um, industrialists and merchants are always looted and ransomed by warriors. And yet, in schools, in, in history manuals, uh, merchants are always represented as selfish exploiters and warriors as heroes. All this is not to say, all, all this what I have been saying here, is not to say that, that there, does, there does not exist immoral behaviors in the capitalist system. But only, and I hope I have been able to prove that, that such a system tends to generate moral behaviors and allows each individual to protect himself from immoral behavior of others, providing, of course, that the government is established only to protect such rights. Now, similarly, it can exist moral behaviors in a socialist system, individual moral behaviors in a socialist system. But such a system does generate immoral behaviors, all the more so that the degree of state control is more pronounced. And this is what we are going to show now. <coughs> On this last slide, when we go from uh, this point here, true liberalism to this one, complete statism, the inducement of immoral behavior increases. And in that order, it brings irresponsibility, theft, corruption, organized lies, massive murder. Now, since you might be tired of uh, formal derivations, I shall illustrate each point through an example. <clears throat> In 
Irresponsibility. Uh, I'm going to take a few of my examples uh, in France. A few years ago, a law was enacted in France to help relieve poor, over-indebted people. And in each area of the country, a commission was created in order to examine incoming files for over-indebted people. And there, there were about uh, six to 10,000 a month. Now, an impressive percentage of the files have been filled by people who, up to then, were able to respect their commitments. So perhaps one third of the files were filled by people who, up to then, had been able to respect their commitments. So that is a perfect example of a law inducing irresponsibility in the people. Uh, theft. Theft, as uh, a most common example, of course, is the creation of money without counterparts by the states, generating inflation. And this, of course, is, uh, amounts to steal money from every citizen. It's too obvious for me to elaborate more on this. Corruption. Another example. In France, uh, supposedly to protect the small stores, it is required to get, permission to, uh, to get permission to open a supermarket. Permission is granted by a local state-controlled commission. And such a scheme invites corruption. If you are an efficient businessman and you think that a supermarket at a given place is a thing to do, then you will want to know from each member of the commission what it takes to get his voice. It is rare, but that happens, that it takes a mere amount of money to buy him. But more often, you, you watch some form of Benin mild extortion. For example, a mayor who is uh, asking you to make a parking in front of the city hall. Organize the lies. Well, every totalitarian government announces glorious achievements for the years to come. And when the years do come and nothing is glorious, the government must recourse to systematic lying to, in order to justify its actions. Then the uh, government to stay in power must eliminate all those who denounce the lies. Then all those who are likely to denounce the lies, uh, the lies someday and so on and so forth. And he, he, it brings this uh, murder on, on a large scale that we have been watching in all totalitarian government. Examples are so numerous and present to your mind that I guess it is not necessary to give any. Now, to conclude this talk, I can do no better than to quote Ayn Rand for the third time in this speech. Criminals are a small minority in any age or country. And the harm they have done to mankind is infinitesimal when compared to the horrors, the bloodshed, the wars, the persecutions, the confiscations, the famines, the enslavements, the wholesale destructions perpetrated by mankind's governments. Potentially, a government is the most dangerous threat to, to men's rights. It holds a legal monopoly on the use of physical force against legally disarmed victims. When unlimited and unrestricted by individual rights, a government is man's deadliest enemy. It is not as protection against private actions, but against governmental actions that the Bill of Rights was written. Thank you. Good. I'm glad I'm not the only one uh, queuing up here. Um, it seems to me that there is some class of people in the world that start out with the question not of what are people's rights, but they start out with the question of what are people's obligations to other people. It seems to me that those people, those philosophies, do not 
generally lead to the conclusions that you said all the different bases, uh, bases of, of ethics uh, lead to. Do you think that that's, uh, you think that that's true? Uh, uh, that there are people like that and there are philosophies like that? And if so, how do you reconcile that with uh, your discussion? Well, as uh, Bumper Hornberger uh, said this morning, uh, and he did touch the subject that you are raising, um, I think the key, the key is uh, voluntary as opposed to non-voluntary solidarity. Nothing in the theory that I have developed this morning prevents you from helping the people you like and even the people you don't like, if you, uh, nothing prevents a um, libertarian to have uh, pity for a, a suffering neighbor. The problem with the people who think that they should help others is that most of the time they think they should help others through redistribution, which means that, uh, in fact, they are not going to imply themselves in the solidarity move, but they are going to use the government to force other people to give money to, to the other. I, I understand I, I have not answered your question properly. Um, <coughs> my point was, it seems that usually people that start out with that question, what are people's obligations, rather than what are people's rights, they tend to come to the conclusion that initiating force is, is okay. Um, I'm not, well that's the, that's my point is a lot of people do come to conclusions the exact opposite of libertarianism, but you're suggesting that all of the different bases of ethics do lead to, to libertarianism. Yep. But I, you see what I'm saying? Lots of people don't obviously come to the conclusion of libertarianism. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Otherwise, this room wouldn't be able to contain a libertarian congress. <laughs> I mean, we, we are a minority, no question about that. We are a small minority. Now, if, if I'm trying to be practical to answer your, your question, what can we do about that? Uh, I think one of the things we can do is not to put forward, for, for people that are not used to our uh, vocabulary, our concept and so forth, I think it's a big mistake to uh, deliver some of the most provocative Ayn Rand messages. Not the one that I have given, which is good enough, but I mean the one of self on selfishness, for example. I think that it is useful for libertarians to show that they care about people, but that they care on an individual basis. And this is a mistake that we do most of the time. In fact, we insist on the fact that, and it was okay because uh, it was among us, but uh, this is precisely what uh, uh, Hornberger did this morning. He said, I don't care uh, if someone uh, is poor or miserable, I don't know. Oh, no, that's not what he said. I don't care. <laughs> if, uh, I, I, give, I give to anyone the right not to care. That's what he said. Well, this is good between us, but I think we should avoid the message of selfishness. We, we care, but we consider caring as an individual matter, not as a matter that should be made compulsory by a state. Thanks. I really liked your use of the Ten Commandments in your talk. Um, there's a phrase in the Old Testament, I think it's from Numbers, that talks about restitution, restoring what's been harmed and adding one-fifth of the value that you might also find useful. But I did want to mention that, at least in the Catholic version of the Bible, the commandments are different. So I thought I'd point that out, because if you talk to Catholics, they'll probably think that, you know, they should see their version up there. <laughs> Pardon me? Reduction, well, no, the command, the, in, in the, in the um, Catholic, I was, went to Catholic school for 11 years, so um, I can rattle them off. But the, uh, the first three are the, uh, the ones for God in the Catholic version, 
Fourth is honor thy father and thy mother. Fifth is thou shalt not kill. Sixth is thou shalt not commit adultery. Seven is thou shalt not steal. Eight is thou shalt not bear false witness. Nine is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And ten is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. So just so that you know what the Catholic version is, it'd be good to have that one on hand. I, I don't know enough about the Protestant Christians to know if that's the same or not. I knew that someday I was going to be caught on that. <laughs> well, well, the problem, it's here, well, here it's good because, you know, you, you can take your message problem, to Christians and not get caught the on The problem it. is that I have a screen a number of Bibles, Catholic as well as Protestants, and uh, in, in most cases, the commandments are not numbered. And it is very difficult, it's a tough <laughs> task really, uh -huh. to, to make ten out of the few sentences that are supposed to be the Ten Commandments. It's not like in the film of Cecil B. DeMille about <laughs> the Ten Commandments, where they are all well listed in number, in big stone, <laughs> in the Bible. Uh, at, twice, at, twi uh, at two places in the Bible are the Ten Commandments listed. And they are not listed in exactly the same words mm -hmm. in the Exodus and in the other part, which is, uh, yeah, yeah okay. exactly. So, what happened in reality is that uh, I, I, my, first, uh, my first attempt at this talk was made in France, in French, mm -hmm. and I used a Catholic Bible. But then, in order to be sure that I was translating properly, not trans my translation, but <laughs> what God said actually to Maurice in English. I called a Jewish friend, a Jewish friend in London, <laughs> oh, gee. and I asked her. I asked her to read me uh, the Ten Commandments as they were uh, written in her Bible. Uh -huh. So there is a problem here. Yeah, there that must be. Just, yeah. well, that's the Catholic version. Okay. If you talk to Catholics, that's the one to use. <laughs> Thank you for your, for your comment. Uh, I, I want to make two comments on the previous two comments, and then I'll have my own comment. Uh, on the first comment, uh, I recall somebody uh, having written, and I think it may have been in a, an ISIL publication, that says, uh, we believe in privatizing charity. And I really liked that expression. Um, the second comment regarding the commandments, I'm, among other things, a lifelong student of the Bible. <laughs> and uh, apparently what happens is between the Catholic and the Protestant versions, or the Catholic on the one hand and the Jewish and Protestant on the other hand, is that the Catholic version excludes commandments against mm -hmm. graven images, because of course Catholic churches are uh, full of graven images. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that's why uh, what they did was they excluded that commandment and then they split the last one into two, so they come out with ten. Uh, okay, my, uh, my own com uh, comment uh, concerns the problem that I see uh, emerging constantly in publications that I receive from Hungary. And that is uh, the problem of unjustly acquired property and what to do about it. Uh, we uh, Libertarians, of course, believe in property rights and so forth, and we don't believe in redistribution and so on. But what do you do with property that has been acquired through the coercive process of the Communist Party? And to go back and look at uh, the... Uh, 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 the um, uh, uh, problem in our, in our own situation. Uh, what do you do with property that has been acquired through the financing of our government uh, in the United States uh, from money that was coercively acquired from the people? Uh, that is uh, probably most of the large property holdings in the United States through the large corporations, the military industrial complex, etc. And uh, I would like to be able to uh, maybe go on to Hungary, which is what I'm planning to do, and talk to some people and uh, have some answers uh, regarding this and, and then discuss the same issues back home in New Mexico. Thank you. Well, certainly the problem of restitution of uh, badly acquired property is a very tough one, and I do not have an answer to that one, and I believe that this is one of the subjects that we are going to handle uh, later on in this uh, Congress, right? 
Uh, there is something on the subject. So I, I, I have no pretense to be able to solve that one. Uh, more, more generally, I think that the, um, the problem of the just or unjust origin of property is one of those that uh, we libertarians are still searching on and uh, we, we do not have, we, we have the uh, answer, the obvious answer of a primary occupant, for example, but it is not entirely satisfactory. Uh, so th this is certainly one, one of the few problems that we have not yet completely resolved and I wish uh, we do someday because uh, what I find myself fascinating in libertarianism and, and worth fighting for it is um, the intellectual, the logical coherence of all aspects of the libertarian uh, movement, uh, theory. There are many, many books on, on uh, if you take the catalogue of laissez-faire book or the catalogue at the end of our ASIL publication, you would find hundreds of books on very different subjects from environment to uh, how to raise your child, your children and so forth. And what I found marvelous is the extraordinary intellectual coherence between all these approaches. But there are still a very few areas where we do not have a, a solidly grounded theory. One other example is uh, when do the children become uh, free? <laughs> Have to be treated as free person. Okay, there is another issue on abortion too, but I'm not going to, to go into this one. Uh, two questions, I think. Two more? Fine. Okay, I'd just like to make a couple brief comments. First, regarding the commandments, I think a good solution would be not to number them. Just put the ones up that you want to use uh, without numbers. And uh, regarding uh, government property, uh, first I would say it should be it, in those cases where the prior owner is obvious and you can prove that, then it should go to that prior owner. And uh, beyond that, uh, I would say that the government property would be distributed among, uh, you know, t to the masses of the people, divided up equally, perhaps through shares. Uh, I would go a step further to say that uh, uh, there should be actually more there because the government bureaucrats and politicians have taken a large amount, and in fact, they should be held liable for the damage that they had caused. Now, I, I doubt we'll ever achieve that, but uh, that should be our goal. Thank you. Uh, j just a brief comment on you and you. Uh, David Friedman, in the uh, Machinery of Freedom, uh, does tackle the subject of uh, property, origin of property. And he's concluding that uh, we libertarians make perhaps too much of an issue about it, which is certainly true of the Western countries, perhaps not of the Eastern countries. But he said that we are making too much of an issue about it because after all, he says something like 80% of the existing property in the United States change hands uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. I don't remember the, the number. So fine, it's perhaps too bad that uh, some centuries ago, some kings have, uh, <laughs> have uh, s uh, stolen uh, unduly property. But let's leave today. I recognize that the problem is more crucial in the, in the Eastern countries. I have an, another question, which is uh, maybe too large to, to treat here. It's, uh, well, I saw in your uh, adapted version of your Nolan chart, you, you didn't put, the, you didn't mention conservatives, because it, it's, it's an important debate, and I think for a Frenchman, Frenchman it's, it's very important. It's the relation between uh, conservatives and libertarians. Uh, and you, you spoke about abortion, it, it was a, a specific case, uh, but I think it's, it's a more a general case. It's, it's to know what, what you do with uh, your liberty and, and uh, what you are obliged to accept that others are doing with their liberty. Because I think there are two, two approaches. You can have, a, a, let's say, a socialist libertarian approach stating that uh, freedom, and, and you spoke about the freedom to experience, was something like an absolute right, and then a more conservative approach that maybe government should not interfere a bit with what individuals are doing, but let us say that, that uh, 
other individuals could interfere, let's say, on, even with force, but let's say if you have private streets, then uh, let's say the owners of that street could say, well, in, in our street, uh, that there should not come, uh, I don't know, um, um, a mosque, I don't know how to translate it, uh, um, or a Buddhist temple or, or anything like that. I mean, th this, this is a form of coercion, but it, it looks totally in line with, uh, the, the, with capitalism. Uh, you could have the, the contrary, in, indeed. Uh, and so my, my question is, it, didn't you omit a, a whole aspect uh, when, when you just spoke about the, the moral foundations of capitalism by just trying to say, well, they, they are in line without saying that freedom allows, let's say, people with religious beliefs to impose their beliefs on other people and so to extend, let us say, their uh, personality on, on other people. I think it's, it's an important point and it, it should be stressed also that, that uh, to be free is also to have the freedom to impose your belief on other people. And I think this is something that, that the libertarian conservatives can say, but it's not the traditional, uh, let's say, speech of libertarians. And I would like, I don't know if my question is very clear, I, maybe I should need what, half an hour to, so to explain it. But if, if you understand it, could you uh, just elaborate on it? Most of your question is fairly clear. <laughs> the only aspect I didn't quite get was the allusion to the French. <laughs> that it was too difficult to understand for a French or something. I, I, I missed the point that you are trying to make there. Well, I mean, the, in, in all Frenchmen are very uh, accounted to, to, to centralized uh, decisions, ah. so everything is either black okay. or white. I mean, it's, uh... Okay. Um, I, I don't think that there is any point in my... Um, so to speak, derivation, my demonstration that uh, that is in contradiction with what you have said. So let us consider what you have said as an addition and not a contradiction. But I, I'll admit on a, a little more general ground that uh, there is a weak point in my uh, demonstration. And the weak point is that I take it for granted that there can exist such a thing as a state, as a government, actually protecting individual rights. And this is a subject of uh, uh, eternal, at least unfinished debate between a part of the libertarian movement, like Murray Rothbard, for example, and another part, like Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand thought that it was impossible to, vi to live without some form of a government, and she was hoping that it was possible to devise a government uh, um, committed only to protecting individual rights, while some other libertarian like um, Rothbard and probably uh, David Friedman consider that there is no chance at all of getting such, ever getting such a, a, a government. So they devise scheme to avoid it, and for my money, those schemes are not much more <laughs> realistic than the one that they are trying to combat. But this is too, too wide a discussion for going on on the subject. So thank you for your attention.